The Legend of Zelda is one of the most beloved series in all of gaming. Over 30 years it has innovated game design, inspired countless other game developers, and changed the landscape of video games for good. To celebrate the launch of the eagerly awaited Tears of the Kingdom, let's take a look at the history of The Legend of Zelda. In the mid-1980s, Shigeru Miyamoto was working on Super Mario Bros. for the Famicom, but began noodling around with an idea for a different game. Miyamoto was inspired by his youth exploring the Japanese countryside and wanted to move away from the linearity of Mario to give players an adventure where they had to carefully consider their next moves. The team worked up a classic damsel in distress tale, whereby the hero, Link, would rescue Princess Zelda from the evil Ganon's lair on Death Mountain. It was a simple premise, but Miyamoto, along with Takashi Tezuka, went on to build something on top of it that would change the kinds of games Nintendo made. It's the Legend of Zelda and it's really rad. Those creatures from Ganon are pretty bad. Miyamoto's stated goal was to focus on allowing players to enter a different world, which he described as a miniature garden, which as a player, looking at a top-down perspective, very much was realized by The Legend of Zelda. The idea of connecting players to the world was so important that the hero was called Link, to represent the bridge between the player and Hyrule. Despite being the first entry in a franchise that would go on to exist for many years to come, The Legend of Zelda laid down very strong foundations, both from a narrative and gameplay perspective. Nearly every subsequent game in the series has featured themes of coming of age, stepping out into the wild unknown, exploring vast worlds, building bonds, and saving the world. Elements such as the Triforce were introduced in the first game and have become a core part of the series and instantly recognizable iconography within games as a medium. And of course, Princess Zelda, named after the wife of novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald, has been present in the vast majority of the games. Ganon was introduced as the Demon King and primary antagonist of The Legend of Zelda and has fulfilled that role since. The first entry in the series also set out the core tenets of the Zelda playing experience, namely exploration, puzzle solving, and battling through dungeons. All of this was new ground for Nintendo, but it proved to be an unmitigated success. Critically, it was described as a groundbreaking game that had an impressive sense of scale and offered a thrilling adventure. Commercially, the game sold over 6 million copies worldwide, and in that time since, has been re-released and made available on newer platforms. The Legend of Zelda remains one of the most influential games of all time and was the springboard for a franchise that would define Nintendo. Legend of Zelda continues. Defeat your enemies, save the kingdom. Beware. Beware. Released just under a year after the original game and with a new development team behind it, Zelda II The Adventure of Link was noticeably different in a number of ways. Its story features the same Link as the first game, but Princess Zelda is different. She's actually THE Princess Zelda from the legend, who had been put under a sleeping spell after refusing to spill secrets about the Triforce. Outside of the overworld, Zelda II was played from a side-scrolling perspective, and it also incorporated magic spells instead of items, limited lives, and RPG systems like experience points and leveling. Its combat was also more varied, most notably including a down-thrust move that would later go on to inspire the core gameplay of games such as Shovel Knight and DuckTales. Zelda 2 was praised by critics and fans for being so different from the original, and while a lot of its gameplay changes weren't carried forward into other entries in the franchise, a number of its elements, such as the introduction of a magic system and the concept of Link's shadow, impacted future games considerably. Released for the Super Famicom in 1991, A Link to the Past acts as a very distant prequel to the other games and is the first in the Hero is Defeated alternate timeline. Oh yes, The Legend of Zelda has multiple timelines and for a deep dive into those, make sure to check out our video right here on GameSpot. <laughs> A Link to the Past is notable for many reasons. It was a return to the top-down viewpoint of the first game, and it was the debut of the franchise's now iconic Master Sword. By collecting three pendants of virtue, Link can obtain the sword from the Lost Woods and use it to defeat Aghanim. The game didn't just take place in Hyrule. Using a magic mirror, Link can also travel to a dark world that was created when Ganon took the Triforce twisting the light and beauty of Hyrule and its occupants into creepy monsters in this realm. The game also features a very fun easter egg. 
Nintendo Power magazine ran a contest where the winner would appear in an upcoming, undisclosed, Nintendo game. The winner was a kid called Chris Houlihan, and there's a secret room in the game where you can find him. A Link to the Past was critically acclaimed and was re-released on the Game Boy Advance, with multiplayer title Four Swords in 2002, but unfortunately, they did remove the easter egg. After development had finished on A Link to the Past, some members of the team started fiddling around with the Nintendo Game Boy after hours to see how the console worked and to see if they could port A Link to the Past to it. Throughout the process, the team started to suggest new ideas and features to implement into the port, and it quickly became apparent that there was enough there for a new game. At the time, David Lynch's TV show Twin Peaks was booming in popularity, and it inspired the team to create something thematically similar, with a small town full of distinctive, memorable characters. Link's Awakening doesn't feature most of the core tenets of the original Legend of Zelda, there's no Zelda, it doesn't take place in Hyrule, and there's no Triforce in sight. Instead, Link is stranded on an island and trapped by a mythical sleeping creature called the Windfish, who he needs to awaken by collecting magical instruments. With Shigeru Miyamoto distracted by other projects, the Link's Awakening team experimented. A lot. They snuck in cameos from other games and focused more on story than previous Zelda titles. It paid off, as not only was it critically and commercially successful, but the emphasis on storytelling helped shape the Zelda franchise for years to come. Hello. Super Mario 64 launched alongside the Nintendo 64 in 1996, and Nintendo originally wanted the next Zelda title, Ocarina of Time, to launch the following Christmas. Or at least, that was the plan. Ocarina of Time ended up being a much more ambitious project than the team anticipated, and on top of all that, they had to get to grips with the new hardware's limitations. When implementing combat, the team was struggling to figure out how to make it work, as they were initially inspired by Chanbara, a Japanese sword fighting technique where the sword is held in both hands, whereas Link holds a shield in one hand and his sword in another. The other problem was making it all work in a 3D space, so the team took a field trip to watch some Chanbara at Toei Kyoto Studio Park, a film studio meets theme park in a similar vein to Universal Studios here in America. They noticed the way that opponents would move and strafe around each other when squaring off. This inspired them to create Z-targeting. By pressing a button, the camera shifts to be directly behind Link, and all of his attacks are aimed right at the target. Link can strafe around so that he's always facing them, and to make it clear which enemy you're targeting, the team made the icon a fairy, which Koizuma, a developer on the team, called the Fairy Navigation System, although this was eventually shortened to the well-known Zelda name of Navi. After Koizumi's wife asked why there weren't any handsome Nintendo characters, the team redesigned Adult Link a little bit. But Miyamoto didn't want Link to be too cool, so the team added Young Link to the game too. Ocarina of Time is so beloved and iconic that me talking about it could be its own video. From riding Epona over Hyrule Field's vast plains, the infamous and beloved dungeons, and the game's clever use of time, it became the quintessential Zelda game for a reason. It was lauded by critics and fans upon release, with our reviewer Jeff Gerstmann saying that it manages to combine small aspects from all the previous Zelda games, giving you the same Zelda feel, but in an entirely new way. Even in its huge, fiercely 3D world, the game retains a truly classic feel. This is a sequel at its finest, expanding on previous themes and bringing plenty of new stuff to the table. It currently sits as the number one game of all time on Metacritic, and is commonly referred to as one of the best video games ever made. It's been named as an inspiration for many game developers, including CD Projekt Red and From Software. A remake of Ocarina of Time for the Nintendo 3DS was released in 2011. After the success of Ocarina of Time, Nintendo had to think about how to create a worthy follow-up. Over the years, game development had become more and more expensive, and with PlayStation powering ahead with 3D games, the pressure was on. Nintendo was examining how they could repurpose their existing games and assets. One idea was to release Master Quest, a hard mode unlocked by completing Ocarina of Time, onto the 64DD peripheral. However, Aonuma, who was tasked with repurposing the game for its new form, quickly grew bored and began making new dungeons. He eventually asked Miyamoto if he could make a new game, and Miyamoto agreed, provided that it could be made within a year. 
Elsewhere at Nintendo, Koizumi was toying with a concept where players would relive the same in-game week over and over again. Koizumi agreed to help Aonuma out on the new Zelda title if they could use the concept, and there, Majora's Mask's innovative three-day system was born. After three days in Majora's Mask, a moon would fall and destroy the world of Termina. Using the ocarina, Link can play the Song of Time and go back to the start of the cycle, and the player retains major items like masks and weapons, as well as knowledge of upcoming events. The masks allow Link to transform into different creatures with new abilities to aid in puzzle solving. The clock counting down as you explored the twisted world of Termina added pressure to the game, which had a decidedly creepier tone than previous Zelda titles. It didn't sell as well as Ocarina of Time, but Majora's Mask still received critical acclaim when it launched. It was remade for the 3DS in 2015. In the late 90s, Capcom developer Yoshiki Okamoto set up a new studio named Flagship. Funded by Capcom, Sega, and Nintendo, the studio worked on various projects, including Resident Evil 2, Code Veronica, and Dino Crisis 2. The team eventually approached Nintendo to suggest porting the original Legend of Zelda to the Game Boy Color. Throughout the development process, however, they realized that the game needed modifications, not only to run on the handheld, but to make it more palatable to a modern audience. After speaking with Miyamoto, the team instead began working on a trio of interconnected games called the Triforce series. The three titles could be played in any order and each focused on different gameplay elements, but by completing all three, you'd get the full story. This ended up being way too complicated for the team to implement, and one game ended up being cut. The remaining two games were Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages. It was and remains rare for developers outside of Nintendo to be tasked with developing a Zelda game, but the return to a top-down 2D Zelda and the dual-release approach proved to be popular and the games were a hit. The games were similar to Link's Awakening, but Link is transported to a different world depending on which game you're playing. The other major distinguishing factor was a key weapon that gave Link a special ability central to the game's mechanics. In Oracle of Seasons, it was the Rod of Seasons, which allows him to manipulate the seasons. In Oracle of Ages, it was the Harp of Ages, which allows Link to travel through time. Naturally, both of these items were critical to the game's combat, dungeons, and puzzles. Although it was yet another experimental take on a Zelda game, both titles were critically and commercially successful. At the Nintendo Space World 2000 trade show, Nintendo showed off a demo that offered a glimpse at what The Legend of Zelda could look like on its upcoming shiny new hardware, the GameCube. While the Link that was showed off looked like a more graphically enhanced version of the Link from Ocarina of Time, internally the team decided to go in a completely different direction. A designer on the team at Yoshiki Haruhana doodled what would become known as Toon Link, a boyish, cartoony version of the series hero. From there, the team was immediately inspired, settling on the game's colorful cell-shaded art style. Early on in its development, the team decided to set the game at sea, with Link sailing between islands on his ship and controlling the wind using the Wind Waker. While the art style proved divisive, the game was a critical success, earning a rare 40 out of 40 from Famitsu and the Game of the Year award from us. Wind Waker is beloved for introducing a version of Link that is much more expressive than his other iterations. Nintendo approached his design with an almost comedic sensibility, which really enhanced the animated movie adventure vibe of the whole game. Toon Link's popularity would also earn him a spot in future Smash Bros. rosters. An HD version of Wind Waker was released for the Wii U in 2013. This version streamlined a number of gameplay elements, including a particularly laborious endgame quest, making it the definitive version of the game. In 2004, Four Swords Adventures launched for the GameCube and allowed up to four players to take on the role of Link and Link's clones to work together to defeat Shadow Link, who has kidnapped the maidens of various shrines. A powerful wizard named Varti is also freed, and a dark dimension appears in Hyrule too. Naturally, all this eventually leads to the revelation that Ganon is up to his old tricks again, but Four Swords Adventure included a pretty involved story for a multiplayer Zelda game. 
It also included a competitive multiplayer mode where you fight against each other in a bid to be the last one standing. Multiplayer worked by connecting Game Boy Advance consoles to the GameCube using link cables, and while critics praised how well it worked, not everyone had a GameCube, Game Boy Advance, and the required cables needed to play with others. The next handheld, Zelda The Minish Cap, was once again developed by Flagship and Capcom. Inspired by the Nat Hat from Four Swords, a key gameplay component was the ability to shrink down to the diminutive size of the Minish. The game told the story of the creation of the magical weapon the Four Sword, which allows Link to make up to three copies of himself, as we saw in the multiplayer Four Swords games. Like Oracle of Ages and Seasons, Flagship and Capcom delivered another beloved entry in the Zelda series, as Minish Cap is fondly remembered for taking the fundamentals of the series and coming up with interesting new twists on them. While the game was criticized for its length, compared to many other Zelda experiences, it had enough fresh ideas to earn it a spot in the hearts of Zelda fans. As first-party support for the GameCube was winding down, Nintendo decided to delay the release of its next Zelda game, Twilight Princess, by a year so it could launch with its upcoming console, a little thing called the Wii. Delaying the release meant the team could polish the game, add more content, and crucially for the Wii version, ensure that the motion controls worked. A fun tidbit is that in Twilight Princess and later in Skyward Sword, Link is right-handed, despite being shown as left-handed in the other games. This is to correspond with the fact that most players would be right-handed. Inspired by a dream where Aonuma was a wolf trapped in a cell, a key mechanic of Twilight Princess is Link's ability to transform into a wolf when he crosses into the corrupted Twilight Realm. Interestingly, this wouldn't be the only wolf game to launch in 2006, as Capcom's Clover Studio also released Okami, and in it you played as a wolf, restoring peace to a very colorful world. But after the colorful capers of Wind Waker, Twilight Princess took the series to a more realistic art style, inspired by the incredibly popular Lord of the Rings movies. Twilight Princess was an enormous success. In its opening week in North America, the company sold more than 600,000 Wii consoles, and three quarters of those were sold with copies of Twilight Princess. An HD version of the game was later released for the Wii U, and included a new dungeon as well as amiibo support. <laughs> While the home console versions of Zelda were returning to a more realistic aesthetic, Zelda on handheld retained the vibrant, colorful aesthetic of Wind Waker with its sequel, Phantom Hourglass for the Nintendo DS. It was heavily praised for making use of the DS's touch controls, with our reviewer Alex Navarro saying that the game implements its control mechanics so seamlessly into the standard Zelda game design that it's hard to imagine anyone not appreciating it on some level. Another widely praised feature was the dungeon at the center of the game, the Temple of the Ocean King, which slowly saps away at Link's health while he's in it. Only by acquiring a special item, and plenty more hearts, can you solve it. Spirit Tracks continued the Wind Waker branch of the franchise and took players from the sea back to land and explored the concept of letting players place their own tracks and journey around Hyrule in a cute little train. The spirit in Spirit Tracks, however, is poor Princess Zelda, who acts as your companion throughout the game and who can take control of enemy phantoms. You can then control them to help you solve puzzles in dungeons or attack nearby enemies. Land. Done. Sea. Done. Skyward Sword took us to the skies in 2011, in another Wii title that's packed to the brim with motion-controlled movements. After implementing motion controls in Twilight Princess, the team began exploring how the Wii Motion Plus device, a peripheral that would plug into a Wii mote to make more precise and complex movements, could be utilized in a Zelda game. Turns out, with some difficulty as the team struggled to tame the finicky add-on to make it work for their purposes. Starting from his home in the clouds, the town of Skyloft, Link hops on the back of a big loft-wing bird to get to where he needs to go. Skyloft is surrounded by a number of other floating islands, all of which have their own denizens to interact with. However, Link could also travel down to the surface overworld, 
and this is where a lot of the traditional adventuring happens. Skyward Sword also let players place beacons of light on a map, which they could then follow to their objectives, an idea that would later return in Breath of the Wild. Skyward Sword also had significant narrative implications, as it is actually the first game in the Zelda canon, and reveals the story behind the creation of the iconic Master Sword. Skyward Sword is remembered as a game that felt like it was caught between trying to take risks and evolve the Zelda franchise into something new and exciting, but also staying true to the series' roots. Nevertheless, it is remembered fondly by fans, and in the end, paved the way for what would end up being a truly revolutionary Zelda title. Skyward Sword was remastered for the Nintendo Switch and released in July 2021. A link between worlds for the Nintendo 3DS didn't have the smoothest development. After Spirit Tracks had launched, many members of the team went on to work on Skyward Sword, with only three left on a handheld Zelda project. Initially, the three pitched Miyamoto on a game with the idea of communication, but it was shot down. Eventually, the trio came up with an idea where Link could enter walls, and Miyamoto gave the team the thumbs up to develop. However, they were quickly pulled onto other projects to help with the upcoming launch of Nintendo's latest console, the Wii U. Not wanting their idea to be forgotten, they gave prototypes to Miyamoto, Tezuka, and Aonuma, who ended up reviving the project some years later. A Link Between Worlds takes place after the events of A Link to the Past, and involves our young hero freeing Princess Zelda from the clutches of an evil sorcerer named Yuga. As always, Yuga's plan is to use seven sages to resurrect Ganon. This time around, however, Link is equipped with a magical bracelet that allows him to merge into walls and become a sticker-like version of himself to move around the world and reach previously inaccessible areas. It was a cool mechanic that created very interesting gameplay opportunities. This was reflected in the critical claim it received, with many reviews saying how the merging mechanic elevated the puzzles and dungeons of the game. It also sold very well. Nintendo teamed up with Grezzo, the studio behind the Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time 3DS ports, for Triforce Heroes, a cooperative handheld adventure which sadly didn't set the world on fire. Our review criticized the dungeons for being repetitive and the game's weak story, but praised its loot system and cooperative modes. But if that was one weak link in the list of mainline Zelda games, then the next game would be a genre-defining masterpiece. Originally due to launch in 2015 for the Wii U, two years later Nintendo released Breath of the Wild, timing it with the release of its brand new console, the Nintendo Switch. After hearing criticisms about the more linear nature of recent Zelda releases, the team opted to make Breath of the Wild open world, with a loose plot of defeat Ganon by rounding up four divine beasts and the champions who pilot them. Players could approach the adventure however they wanted. The large open world is littered with places of interest, dungeons to best, enemy groups to defeat, and of course, puzzles to solve and secrets to find. In almost every respect, Breath of the Wild felt like a modernization of the Zelda franchise and, in a few ways, set the standard for how open-world games could be designed going forward. After flirting with the open-natured structure in numerous other titles, Nintendo finally committed to letting the player chart their own path, and the impact that had on the overall experience was revolutionary. Link was no longer tethered so strictly to the ground, as he could now scale pretty much any surface which introduced an unprecedented verticality to the game and made exploration itself a major puzzle. Well-worn design ideas such as towers that uncover a map were given new life in Breath of the Wild, which chose to tell the player very little about what was actually around the world and instead tasked them with discovering it for themselves. Combat was also revolutionized, becoming more open to expression, Along with traditional items like the sword, shield, bombs, and bow and arrows, Link gained special abilities, such as freezing certain objects and enemies in place, with damage dealt to whatever was in stasis, stacking along with any other physics-based effects. Coupled with the ability to leap higher, impact movement with items and weapons, and Breath of the Wild's combat became a playground of possibilities. An entire community has grown around discovering the outlandish things you can do with the mechanics of the game, and you only have to take a look at the videos created by our very own bona fide Breath of the Wild expert Max to see just how wild it can get. The game launched to universal critical acclaim with tens across the board from most major gaming outlets. Needless to say, Breath of the Wild put Zelda on a new path, and it's one that is poised to take the franchise to even greater heights with its next entry. Which brings us to Tears of the Kingdom. Although Breath of the Wild had DLC, the team had big ideas that they could only implement by making another game. 
Like Skyward Sword, Tears of the Kingdom has islands floating above the ground, introducing a whole new dimension of exploration to the sequel. Link will also now have expanded and new abilities like Fuse, which can bind objects together to create new weapons, and Recall, which reverses time for a targeted object. Expectations are high for Tears of the Kingdom, and we'll know soon enough whether Link and Nintendo can rise to meet them. Thanks for watching! It's going to be an exciting week here on GameSpot because we have new shows premiering every single day. Tomorrow, Kurt is going to be taking a look at why there are so many remakes. Dave Klein is going to be looking at how Resident Evil 4 saved the Resident Evil franchise. John Luke's going to tell you how to get the best out of Remake. And we also have a brand new news show with me and Tam where we discuss all of the biggest issues in the gaming industry. We'll also have a sword expert take a look at Jedi Survivor and of course the return of Firearms Expert Reacts. Now to celebrate, we are going to be giving away a lot of prizes, including copies of brand new games like Redfall, Jedi Survivor and even a PlayStation 5. This is open to US residents only. If you want to be in with a chance of winning, make sure to check the pinned comment below.